So good afternoon. Um, welcome to the SDG Media Zone. We're about to start our next session. If everyone can take this seat, and I'll hand the floor to Dominic. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, do you want me to use a microphone, or are we okay to? I'll use a microphone. Okay. Thank you very much, and uh, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, welcome to the afternoon of day one of the uh, UN Conference on the Oceans and the Ocean SDG. I'm delighted to be able to host this short uh, conversation about an important announcement that was made earlier this morning um, at uh, one of the first side events of this summit, which was the launch of the Tuna 2020 Traceability Declaration. Um, you should have copies of it available to you, and some of my colleagues will be able to give them to you um, as we go through the discussion or afterward. This is an important declaration. Um, it brings together, at the bequest of the President of the General Assembly, Peter Thompson, who's hosting um, the discussions obviously this week, the public sector, the private sector, civil society, scientific organizations for pretty much the first time to bring together the body of work and the various initiatives and programs that have been deployed for several years on the issue of traceability for illegal, unreported and unregulated fish, particularly tuna. And we're going to talk a little bit about the declaration and about the scale of the problem and the innovation that's behind this solution set. And I'm delighted with um, the small panel that we have here to talk um, about this, um, not least to, to welcome and to congratulate uh, Peter Thompson, President of the UN General Assembly, who, um, if I may say so, sir, had much of the inspiration and idea behind putting on this, um, this conference uh, this week. So on behalf of everyone at the World Economic Forum, my chairman, just to congratulate you on an excellent kind of execution and delivery of a vision which you had, sir. Um, next to um, the President of the General Assembly is Veronica Poncheva, who's the Global Director of Corporate Responsibility for Metro Group Wholesale and Food Specialist Company, who are one of the signatories to the declaration. So we'll hear from the retail side, a very big retailer in Europe, as to why one would be interested um, in this issue of illegal fish and tuna and why one is interested in signing such a declaration. And last, but by no means least, I'm delighted to welcome um, the former president of Kiribati, um, Anote Tong, um, who, as you know, has been a champion for many years on the whole issue of um, fishing and, and oceans and has been a, a real champion of this declaration over the last several weeks, and particularly today, um, representing kind of many dimensions of this. So with a first class panel um, to uh, talk about this issue, I will hand over straight away, Peter, if I can, to you, and to ask um, a little bit about, um, we know that the SDG for oceans is important intrinsically, but perhaps you're able to kind of remind us why this is such an important goal, goal 14. And in particular, um, you said as a challenge to draw together the public and the private. Um, to come together in partnership and collaboration with civil society on this. We, we believe with all of our colleagues that um, there's a delivery here, but is that an important aspect of this conference and of the solution set to the SDG, public and private partnership? Thanks very much, Dominic, and thanks for your kind words. Um, I'll answer that question if I can remember it when I get around to it, but I just could not let this moment pass because uh, I was just telling people in the last room that I was sitting at and, and, and now we're up on the podium together. You know, back in 1978, for a year, uh, President Tong and I, uh, in 1978, most of you weren't born, uh, shared a room at the Pacific Forum Secretariat where we were working on regional issues in Suva, uh, my hometown. Uh, and just looking across at him there, I'm thinking, you know, it's obviously more stressful running things at the United Nations than it is <laughs> running a country because he's looking great and I'm looking at like I'm on my way out. But anyway, it's just... <laughs> So wonderful to uh, be sitting up here after all those decades uh, next to Anote, which we did so often back in 78. And if I can remember what your question was, I think it was something to do with this conference that we're all attending, and SDG 14, which of course this conference has been designed to support. You know, we're here to uh, make sure that uh, SDG 14 is getting the support it needs to succeed. And when I say support, I don't mean financial resources. I mean that we've got the global consciousness to a point where all human beings realize that they have to support SDG 14 or basically say goodbye to life in the ocean. We're at that stage. 
so when people sort of look at us and say, well, what's the United Nations doing about whatever, or what a government is doing about it, that's not really my answer. My answer is, what are, you, what are we all doing about it? What are you doing about it? And that's where the public-private uh, partnership comes in, of course. And there's far more energy and far more resources uh, outside the public sector than there is inside it. So it's absolutely essential that uh, initiatives such as the uh, Tuna 2020 uh, initiative uh, are, are, um, are entered into it because this is where the energy lies, is where the scientific knowledge lies uh, outside of the, the public sector. But we in the public sector, we've got our responsibilities too. So uh, this is a great example of a partnership and uh, couldn't be more timely. Thank you, sir. Um, if I can pass that microphone on to the President. Um, so um, we've seen that at least 50 companies now have signed on to this uh, declaration. Um, so together with um, probably the, the leading group of uh, international scientific bodies uh, and uh, NGOs and others. And I was um, reflecting on some of the conversations that we had earlier today when we launched this, um, when you were uh, suggesting that it's really good to see movement from the private sector um, coming toward the support and help of um, nations such as yours. So this is a kind of a new development in, in potential cooperation. And I wonder if you could offer some further reflections on that um, in relation to the scale of the problem that we face with tuna and illegal fishing. Uh, thank you, Dominic. And uh, before I do that, let me trace it back all the way to 1978, because that's where it all began with the advent of the Law of the Sea Convention. Uh, the, when the, in, at the forum, we, were, we began to talk about that and what, uh, as a region, would be our response to the um, coming into force of the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea. And uh, that, of course, resulted in the establishment of what is now the, the Foreign Fisheries Agency. But uh, since then, a great deal has happened. I mean, uh, as, uh, as countries, as nations, who for the first time had to deal with um, with nature, for foreign fishing nations, because previously they just came in and fished without having to seek permission. And so for the first time they did. And also for the first time they had trouble and they did not accept that they had to come in and ask permission to come and fish. So there was a lot of, a lot of tension. And so it took us as countries a lot of time to try to resolve the, 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 this um, apparent uh, an acceptance of, uh, of the new regime by the the foreign fishing fleets. And uh, we, on the other hand, did not have the experience to manage our EEZ. We didn't know anything about fishing. And so in, in the, while we were negotiating access, we knew nothing about it. We had no data, no information. And so we were very much disadvantaged. And we, I'm sure they got away with quite a bit at that time. But since then, there's been a radical change. And so we moved on as nations, uh, as nations with a uh, new responsibility to try and see what we could do with it. How could we manage this? And um, it was a struggle, as I said. And, uh, it was a lot of, even then, there was a lot of illegal fishing. People, uh, fishing companies didn't bother to license vessels uh, uh, to a large extent, thinking that they could get away, and of course they did. And uh, so the relationship then was very tense. It was us against them, uh, the, the governments against the, the private sector. Now, what we are seeing is a radical change, a transformation of the relationship, which is very healthy. As I said this morning in our discussions, it's a, it's, it's a powerful partnership where everybody for the first time begins to understand that you, we all have a role to deal with this. Otherwise, we will have nothing left, as Peter said. And so it is not in our interest to do that. It is in our interest to ensure that everything remains sustainable. For the, the coastal states, uh, most of these countries in the Pacific, in the region, and I'm sure it's true for the other regions, they depend very largely on the revenue from uh, fisheries. As I said this morning, and I dare challenge the, the all sides of the industry, including the, um, the, the different partners, including the, the coastal states as well, that uh, let's try and restructure the industry so that um, there would be um, the sharing of value. Because at the moment, countries like ours, we get less than 10%. Let's restructure it so that we would then have the ability to maybe deal with our climate uh, issues, climate challenge. Because at the moment, some of our islands are seriously threatened. Yet we don't have the capacity to build resilience. 
And I say, if you would allow us to take a greater share in the industry, if you would allow us to participate with you on a different level, perhaps then we would not be going around looking for solutions to our climate resilience issues. And so I, I applaud what is happening with the, the declaration on the um, on traceability because it adds to what's already we have what we as nations have been trying to achieve <clears throat> and it comes interestingly enough from the other end of the, the industry which is very healthy and it's uh, very empowering and I think it's a good thing so congratulations for having put this together and of course I want to thank the the private uh, sector people who have had the courage to come forward and understand that, that, that this relationship that it's got to be an equitable relationship where everybody comes away benefiting uh, and happy. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. President. And um, that's a, a perfect kind of um, introduction perhaps to Veronica. Um, um, and you're representing one of those um, from the private sector, particularly a very large retailer um, in Europe, um, Metro Group. Um, and I guess for some people in the room, it'd be interested to know kind of why would you be interested in a declaration on traceability in, in tuna? And here we are at the heart of the United Nations with all of the SDGs and big color behind us um, and goals on oceans and partnerships. This isn't really where businesses are at, or is it? Well, Dominic, first of all, thank you for, uh, for the question and thank you for the chance to be part of the TUNA 2020 Traceability Declaration. Indeed, at Metro, we are committed to much more than SDG 14. We have clear commitments to all sustainable development goals. But for you, who don't know so much our company, we are active in 35 countries, and we move every year more than 200,000 tons of fish. Fish is very important for us. We serve on our retail side consumers, we serve independent businesses, we serve chefs, we also operate as a food service distribution. And as the appetite for fish and seafood products is growing, we see also our responsibility to deal with that topic in a different manner. And I, I cannot give you data of what our volumes were back then in 1978, because that year came several times in the conversation. But <laughs> we, <laughs> unfortunately, I cannot get hold of this data immediately. However, we are more than 50 years in business, and we hope to be for at least 50 years more in a sustainable fish business. Therefore, when the conversation happened uh, with regard to the tuna traceability, actually my question or our question was, why only tuna? Is it only tuna? But we understand that this is a very good starting point and we all believe that we have to be able to show progress and to be really able to deliver the, the commitments. As, as a fish operator and as a retail and wholesale operator, we see ourselves as an important melting point where we can put as a platform of sharing data and on one side communicating to consumers what sustainable tuna means because a lot of consumers do not know that but in the same time encouraging our industry partners to deal with that topic on the high professional side from big international operators but also through the small fisheries and there are solutions in traceability which we are already incorporating but the essential thing is that Everybody has to contribute into su su in supply chain traceability or transparency. And we have to be able to put this platform in a way that people are not coming with their isolated island solutions, but everyone has to contribute if you want to, to have this uh, visible. And today, in the morning, I think we heard of very, very good technological solutions. So I have no question that this will go soon beyond Tuna. Thank you so much. No, there's, there, there's so many angles in this. I'm, I'm reminded of, is it goal 17 around partnerships for action, which link back then to goal 14 on life below water, um, which is perfectly positioned above you um, on, the, on the podium here. Um, and this idea that actually um, this declaration which was launched um, this morning is just the start. Um, we expect to see so many more companies and uh, nations and organizations signing on to this. So it will grow. Um, and it will grow towards 2020, which of course is the target time period for 14.4, um, um, the target related to the goal around illegal fishing. And as was mentioned, 
um, we have some very strong interest from those in the technology space who are looking to perhaps create um, new innovations to help drive that uh, traceability process forward. It's just there to you. Mm -hmm. Responsible production and consumption. Yeah. 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 <laughs> um, so all in all, we're, we're very excited by um, and what has been triggered by your vision um, and the challenge that you set uh, for us um, back in uh, our annual meeting in, in Davos. I think we have over $150 billion of, of revenue now behind this behind this declaration, 50 companies and counting, as you say, you know, a number of the leading organizations. We're very grateful um, for the uh, leadership from the Packard Foundation and from the Benioff Oceans Initiative at UC Santa Barbara, which helped support this work, and for the many organizations which helped put the text together. If I may, um, I might ask um, our colleague uh, Veronica from um, Metro Group to perhaps officially hand the declaration okay. between two presidents, and okay. might be a chance <laughs> you want to take a photograph. <laughs> Um, if you want to put your well, uh, Mr. President of the General Assembly, on behalf of more than 75 signatories from the private sector, governmental NGOs, it's my honor to hand over to you this wonderful document and to hope that it's uh, just a beginning of the, the traceability and helping the sea to become healthier. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm honored to be the recipient of this, and I will certainly be blowing its trumpet uh, all during the week. Uh, you know, the reason I was craning my neck around here to see if responsible consumption and production was there, you see at SDG 12, is I think it's very much in line with that as well. I, um, I'm not a particularly idealistic man, but I stopped eating canned tuna a long time ago. I've been waiting for something like this to assure right, me right. that I'm eating sustainable tuna. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, illegal, unreported, uh, unregulated uh, fisheries cost uh, us about, uh, what is it, about $24 billion. That's direct theft from uh, mostly developing countries, direct theft. So um, apart from that stealing aspect, I don't want to eat unsustainable fish stocks. You know, it's like eating snow leopards or rhinos or something. We have to look at bluefin tuna and where it's going and think about that. Do you really want to be the last person to eat the last bluefin tuna? Uh, other tuna, uh, such as what we're looking at here, skipjack uh, and so on, are in, in, in manageable state as long as we sustainably manage. So that's all we want to know, that they're, being, that they're coming from legal catches and that it's a sustainable fisheries and that we're more than happy to uh, keep eating the healthy stuff, which of course is fish but not if it's coming from unsustainable or illegal uh, catch. So I'm really delighted to be uh, part of the launch of the Tuna 2020 Traceability Declaration. I really congratulate, especially the private sector in this regard. And uh, congratulations to WEF as well, darling. Thank you. And um, perhaps if you take your microphone down, you can hold the declaration up. Um, and then there's a chance for a, a Wow, I think it was 1978 all over again. <laughs> okay, great. Thank you very much. Thank you.